Well, good morning, church. It's such an honor to be bringing our third part of the New Normal series this morning. I've entitled it Necessary Exchanges on this Pentecost Sunday. You know, we celebrate Pentecost 50 days after Easter. We celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. And then Pentecost is actually when Jesus, after he ascended, he talked to his disciples and he told them, hey, go to Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower you to go and tell others about the good news. And so that's essentially what Pentecost is all about. It's where the disciples were were huddled in the upper room waiting on God as he had instructed when, uh, when they were visited with tongues of fire and the power of the Holy Spirit in filling them, speaking other languages, and people were amazed at these signs and wonders. And so today is just a great day to remember that we too need this same gift of the Holy Spirit moving and living in our lives so that we can be empowered to live out the gospel life that God has called us to. Before we dive into the story of Abram and Sarah, let's take a moment and pray. Father, I thank you for today. I ask you, Lord, that you would speak through me, speak through your word today, Father, into the various living rooms around uh, our DMV area and around the world, wherever people are tuning in. Father, I know that you want to meet with us. And so I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would come and you would divide this word a thousand different ways and you would speak to us as your sons and daughters right where we're at. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're gonna jump into a lot of scripture, so I wanna remind you, take this story of Abraham and Sarah and read it for yourself. So we're going to actually pick up where the story starts in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, uh, God calls Abram out and his wife Sarah to go to the land that he will show them. Now they don't have a map, they don't have kind of an address with an iPhone GPS. They just say, yes, God, I'll go. I don't know about you, but I don't even like leaving my home unless I know like, how long is it going to take? Where am I going? Point A, point B, right? I want to plan it out. That is not the situation here. God calls them to take a journey, to take an adventure with them in their mid-70s, mind you. Um, You know, again, that's a paradigm shift, even thinking through the fact that God's calling them into the greatest adventure of their lives in their mid-70s, right? Um, They've been waiting on some promises, maybe some desires from God during this time, And it's not happened. And now he says, come on out. I'm taking you to the land that I'll show you. And essentially, this is where we're going to pick up the story in Genesis 15. They have said yes to God and they've stepped out. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my house will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, look up to the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now this leads us to our first exchange. Exchange number one is complaining for Thanksgiving. You see, Abram and Sarah had set out on this journey. They didn't know where they were going. They trusted God. And through the journey that leads us up to chapter 15, they have encountered some hardships. We know that they encountered famine. We know that they they went off route into Egypt right, to escape the famine. We know that they decided to to kind of pretend to be siblings during this time, which led to Sarah being taken into Pharaoh's palace, right? Not a great situation, right? Probably led to some marriage issues. So they've had famine. They've had some marriage issues now, some strain. They also took Lot with them on this journey, right? Lot was the nephew of Abram. And they've now expanded. The land can't support them. And so they end up splitting ways. So we've got some family drama, some hardships that they have now encountered. So he's probably getting a little tired. And he begins to complain. I know none of us know anything about that, especially in this COVID season, right? 
We, when waiting takes longer than we think, right? When, we, when God has spoken a promise to us and yet we have no idea, no dimension about how long we're talking, right? We don't have the GPS knowing it'll take exactly an hour to get from here to here, right? We don't know. And so in the waiting, we have to learn to trust God. And so that's what we see here where Abram's getting tired and he begins to complain. God, you said you would give me an offspring, but you haven't. So should I go ahead and start making other plans? Should we do it? Should, should, should this promised child actually come through uh, a servant, right? He, he's having a moment with God here. Have you ever been there? Have you had dreams in your heart that you know, you believe are from God, and yet the path that you've taken looks nothing like you thought, or the wait is taking far longer than you would like it to? Have you ever been there? I know I've been there even in COVID season, finding myself complaining, right? I, I, know, I know none of you can relate to this. In fact, just yesterday, I found myself feeling tired. I began to feel, man, God, I'm getting tired. I'm getting weary, just like Abraham, right? And I'm going into the kitchen for the thousandth time to make meals again. And I find myself beginning to kind of fight these negative thoughts about, man, I'm tired, I'm done with this, right? Which are gonna take me no good place. And I began, and I just took a moment by the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit quickening me in that moment, and I made an exchange. God, thank you that I have food in my pantry to make a meal. Thank you that I have people to make it for. Now, this takes work, this doesn't come natural, but these are exchanges that are available to us. And as we begin to change our mind about things, God begins to reveal the next steps and the path that we're to take through it. We've all experienced this kind of weariness in this season. We have that in common. You know, I was reminded of my dad. My dad was a police officer, and so as an elementary kid, I began to play with his handcuffs on a day that he was working, and he specifically told me that weekend, do not play with my handcuffs, right? So as a kid, what does that mean? I definitely am going to play with the handcuffs, right? And so I began to play with them, not knowing that my dad had the keys to the handcuffs. And so, you know, it was all fun and games until they began to get hot, uh, tighter on my wrist. And I began to move, and I'm uncomfortable at this point. And the more that I moved, the tighter that these handcuffs got, right? And I, I thought, man, that is so much like complaining, right? Complaining can be like handcuffs. When we feel like we don't have, we're, we're trapped, right, in some way, be it physically, emotionally, spiritually, and you just feel stuck, right? You, you, you begin to, to, to wrestle with your circumstance, wrestle with your situation, and negativity and, can, and, and uh, complaining can be exactly like that. They'll just get tighter, and your situation just gets that much more miserable. But how many know God has the keys? He's given us the keys to make a great exchange. Those keys to unlocking those handcuffs are an attitude of gratitude, even if your physical situation doesn't yet change. You know, I took Hannah uh, for Memorial Day weekend. It's taken me a long time to kind of think, okay, is it time? Like, can we go out anywhere? And so I took the one child that I thought we might have a chance of keeping a mask on for more than 30 minutes, right? And so my six-year-old daughter, um, about 15 minutes into strawberry picking into an, a large field, it took about 15 minutes and she's like, I'm getting rid of this thing. It's too hot. I can't breathe. Well, of course, right? There's a lot of things as we begin to come out out of a state at home order that are uncomfortable. They are not normal. They are not normal. There's gonna be a lot of things that we can begin to find ourselves grumbling and complaining about. Even on the ride there, I was remembering days that I used to commute to work for many, many hours. People living in the DMV and other metropolitan areas know that that can be a real pain point, a place where it is really easy to complain. And I was reminded as I started my car that I had not been able to drive for, you know, 10 plus weeks, I began thanking God in that situation. Isn't it funny how our circumstances and our, and our, uh, and our situations can change the way we think about things? That is what God is asking us to do. He is asking us in this season, before you come out, let me just tell you, there's going to be things to complain about, but I need you to put on a new mind. I need you to make a great exchange a great exchange from complaining to thanksgiving. 
You know, Philippians 2, 14 and 15 says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Here's the key to making the great exchange. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. And if we're wondering, God, I'm ready. What, what Can I take that next step? And he's saying, wait, here's what we can do. Here's the action. Pray continually. Pray continually. Give thanks. Thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for our lives in Christ Jesus, even if you don't like it. We gotta give thanks. We've gotta use those keys that he's given us to make this divine exchange. You know, we're not giving thanks for the COVID virus. There has been a lot of sorrow that has come through this. Thousands of people have lost their lives. It's a serious matter. But here's the good news. The good news is that we can continue to look for the silver lining in this season. We can focus on what is God doing in this circumstance, in this situation, into our new normals. We can keep our eyes lifted high, as the psalmist David said, looking to our help. Right, looking to the hills where our help comes from. Psalms 121, 1. You know, Psalms 55, 22 reminds us also that, hey, I know you're gonna have burdens, but all you have to do, let me give you some more action. If you're getting tired in the waiting, let me give you some action steps. Cast your cares upon the Lord. I got a lot of cares. I know you do too. Cast your cares upon the Lord in the waiting, and he will sustain us. And Carry each other's burdens. That's what Galatians 6, 2 says. As a spiritual family, that's what we're called to do. And so in this season, we can cast those cares. You gotta get it out. Get it out. Cast those cares. He can handle it. And tell it to a brother or sister who can help you, remind you to take it to the Lord together. That's sometimes that's all we need. We need to confess our sins one to another and we're healed. In fact, the other night, I told my best friend, my husband, Jeremy, I said, hey, I'm getting tired and I'm sorry for the way that I responded. My flesh is just tired. And I had to apologize. Can I tell you something? When I confessed my sins to him, I felt a burden lift. Maybe for some of you, you don't have that place. You don't have that person to talk to. I want to encourage you, if you do or if you don't, It is a good idea to get involved in a spiritual family through groups. We have groups launching in the summer, and these are small groups. And essentially, because in a COVID season, we are doing it virtually as we did in the spring, we are going to launch those again on June 14th for a summer semester. I would encourage you to consider either creating a safe space and being that host to help create a space where people can bring those burdens, to share those burdens and give them to the Lord, or just join one. Maybe that's your next step. Just take a step this summer and join a group. So here's your challenge. What is something that you're thankful for right now? Even now, put it in the chat, write it out. Take, maybe you're a journaler. Take that journal and turn it into a gratitude journal in this season and write, what are you thankful for? Look for the silver lining in this season. You know, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, this is the fight. This is what we're doing here to make this great exchange that God has made possible for us. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive, every complaining thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. It's not that you're not going to have them. He's just giving us the action and the waiting. What do we do? We're training our mind. We're putting on the armor, right? We are learning how to fight our battles in the spirit. This leads us to exchange number two, control for trust. We're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 16, one and two. Now, Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, I want to read that again. The Lord has kept me from having children. You know, in the wait, when we get weary, we sometimes perceive the situation totally off. She's now blaming, right? She feels shame about the wait. She feels shame that she is now beyond the years of what she would imagine, what she imagined for her life having children, right? She has been on this journey. She trusted God, and she's not even where she's going to be yet. 
right? And so this shame then becomes blame. She's looking for somewhere to who to blame. And so she blames God in the waiting. And we see that God spoke just in chapter 15. God's reminding Abram as he's gotten tired. She, he's reminding him of the promises. Hey, I'm going to give you an offspring from your own flesh. And yet his wife in chapter 16, just one chapter later, she's devising her own plans to make it happen. I know you've never done that, right? I've never done that. I've never, never taken, taken plans and matters into my own hand. It is hard to wait on the Lord. Sarah decided to try, and she tried to control the situation. At the heart of the matter, she's trying to control the outcome and get the outcome that God has promised rather than trusting God's process. You know, perhaps she had her eyes on the promise, and in the waiting, the promise became the idol. In her case, it was Isaac. What idols are you rushing to go after in this season when God is saying, hey, will you trust me and do it my way? He knows us. He knows every hair on our head. He knows the things. He wants the things that he's put in your heart to come to pass more than we do. But we have to learn to trust his process. Trust the paths of weakness in which he will lead us. It's not always strength to strength. It's not always mountaintop to mountaintop. There are hard roads in between, but man, if we will trust him in the process, he will bring it to fruition. You know, as a culture, we don't like waiting right? We all have Amazon Prime likely where, you know, things conveniently show up at our door. And even in COVID season, you know, there was jokes and memes going around just like, hey man, in COVID, you're having to wait like wait weeks for toilet paper, right? And like, it makes you think like, wait a minute, we can have toilet paper like delivered to our doorstep. Like generations before us would have loved, they couldn't even comprehend how quick that is, right? And so what I'm saying is like, our culture is prime not to help anybody out right? We are going to have to work really hard at the art of waiting God's way because our culture is primed for instant Netflix, you know, uh, Spotify. I could keep going on all the apps list, our iPhones, everything. We shop at the click of a finger and this doesn't help us learn God's ways. He's not in a hurry. He knows your end from your beginning. He knows the day you were born and what he put on the inside of you. And he knows what he has for you. We have to learn to trust. You know, I've heard it this way. If God were small enough to be understood, he wouldn't be big enough to be worshiped. His ways are not our ways. We have talked about that a lot as a Catalyst Church family, Isaiah 55, eight and nine. So what that tells me, it's my job to learn God's ways and to align my heart with his heart. You know, if if all we do is lean on our own understanding, much like Sarah did in this situation, we just create messes. And and here's the good news. The good news is that he does he does make beautiful things. He does bring masterful things out of our messes for sure. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. He's telling us this is not gonna make sense. This journey of trusting me is not gonna always make sense, but you've got to learn to have faith in my goodness and who I am over your life. You know, as we begin to emerge out of uh, this stay-at-home order, we're going to have lots of opportunities, um, to real temptations to take quick steps. And I want to encourage us. I want to encourage us in this season to be mindful that we don't unknowingly open the door of control, which invites a whole lot of other evil in that we never intended. In fact, James 3.16 says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. You know, when we feel stressed, we're more prone to sin. When we're in a rush, when we're in a hustle, perhaps all this slowing down has been able, it's been an opportunity for us to really reflect on what's going on in our souls at the heart of who we are. You know, practically, when you find yourself making those hasty, driven, impatient decisions, just take a step back and wait a little longer right? Get some wisdom from God and others in your life and and, and make sure that this is the step that God is calling you to take. You know, had Sarah had some God-fearing sisters around, perhaps they could have helped her think about the downstream impact of her decision to give her servant to her husband to sleep with. I mean, wow, 
Like, talk about family drama, right? There's going to be a lot of heartache along those roads. And maybe, just maybe, had she had some people to process with, they could have helped her uh, to make better decisions. You know, here's the good news, right? God is a redemptive God. Right after Sarah creates a mess of her life, right? This is like colossal mess up, right? God redeems her and he actually changes their name together. And I love that because in Jewish culture, your name is actually believed to be prophetically call you into your destiny. Think about it. Every time someone calls your name, they are speaking forth your destiny and calling it forth right? The, the, in, the, in the Jewish culture, they understand the importance of a name. And so what God is doing is he's just, he, he didn't change their name completely, right? He changed their name to get them right back on track where he started, right? He's just saying, hey, 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 I still have a destiny and a plan for you. And it's that you would give your, you would have your own offspring. And so I just want to bring you back. And he changes their name from going Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah. And what he's saying is he's calling them into their right full place, their destiny, the one that he had in mind, which is to be a patriarch and a matriarch of our faith. We are her daughters. We are their children. How awesome is that to have a heritage, to have a faith heritage that we got grafted into, that, that is just, we serve a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. Some of you think that you've messed up. Let me help you out. I wouldn't be standing here today if I allowed every mistake and every misstep and every shortcoming to stop me from stepping into what God has called me to do. You know, 1 Corinthians 127 says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He is not looking for a perfect resume. Yes, that is for you in the DMV area. I know that perfect resumes are what others look for, but that is not what God qualifies you in God's eyes. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. Isn't that like our God? So that Christ's power may rest on me. You know, I remember uh, as I began to earn income as a teenager um, and working, my dad actually said, Hey, Christina, I want to teach you some principles, right, about, um, about how, to, how to steward your finances. And I remember him using uh, a tight fist. And he was like, hey, as you've learned to trust God with the 10%, right, he gave you the gifts and abilities to actually earn the income. As you give him that 10%, he is going to do far more with that 90%. And so you're going to have to learn to allow God, open that hand, don't live tight-fisted, and allow God to flow through you. And I thought, what a great example of our lives. If we try to live this controlled life, right? This is the plan. I have to stay on it, right? Um, we will miss out on all that God wants to do. He wants all of our lives. He doesn't just want our Sunday morning, right? He wants our family life. He wants our co vocational career decisions. He wants our relationships. He wants it all. And as we learn to live with our hands wide open, God, yes, send me. Take me where you want to take me, just like Abraham and Sarah did, right? Even if along the way they begin to kind of clench up their fist again, he's saying, hey, 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 remember, remember, open your hands and allow me to lead you. You know, in this COVID season, if it's taught us anything at all, <laughs> we don't control everything. We can't plan everything, right? Even as a societal level, COVID-19 took a lot of industries and individuals off guard, right? All of us were impacted. And let us not come out of this season thinking that we can control the future. We can help shape it as we follow God. We don't rush ahead. We trust Him. We don't take matters into our own hands trying to get back to something that is clearly gone, but saying yes to the new normal that God has for each of us with open hands, church. Let us make this grand exchange that is possible. It is only possible with God. He's made it available. And so let's take him up on this and really learn to trust God in this season. Which leads us to exchange number three. 
sorrow for joy. We see in Genesis 18 that the Lord sends angels to talk to Abram. He's 100 years old at this point. 15 years have passed since the moment that they stepped out on this journey. They are still not where they're going. They still do not have offspring in which he's promised. And he's tired again, right? He's taken a moment under the tree. And God sends angels to speak to him. And they begin to prophesy that he will have children and that it will come actually one year from the date that he's speaking. He asks, where is Sarah? Sarah's in the tent kind of overhearing the situation, and she laughs. And that's where we're going to pick up in Genesis 18, 13, and 14. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Church, is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. So we see that she, again, kind of feels some shame, right? She's, la- she, she's got some sorrow going on. She's got disappointment, clearly. Things have not gone the way that she probably would have liked them to go, and she's sad. And in that moment, she sarcastically laughs, like, can God really do this? Does he know how old I am? Really, is he really going to do this? So it has a tinge of sarcasm in it. And then we see in Genesis 21, only couple chapters later, Sarah does conceive and she does give birth to Isaac, the promised child. That's where we're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 21, 6 and 7. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abram that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Now we see Sarah laughs in chapter 18. She laughs in chapter 21, but they are very different laughs. You know, scholars believe this is a year, right? That's what was prophesied. And we see, man, in this year, she's had a change of perspective, right? What difference can a year make in our inner worlds? What, can, what difference can it make? You know, when everything else around has been shaken, we've seen that. What is God shaking up on the inside of us? Could it be that we need to leave some sorrow and some disappointment behind and begin to move out with God into our new normals? You know, perhaps you find yourself kind of sarcastically laughing at this whole situation and where you find yourself laughing. And God is saying, hey, if you will just trust me, you will laugh at the end of all of this, but it will be a different kind of laugh. It will come from a different place. You know, the first laugh was about sorrow and disappointment and doubt and heartache, right? The second laugh is one of pure joy. It's one of pure joy because I think what happened between chapters 18 and 21 is that Sarah has realized that the joy didn't actually come in Isaac. It didn't actually come in the promise that she tried so hard to make come to pass. Her joy came in the process through the sorrow because how many know when Isaac actually showed up, she still had Ishmael living on her property. She still had to see Hagar. She still had to see his son living there as a reminder. And yet, even in the sorrow, she had learned to to the pure joy of knowing how to wait on God through it all. You know, I wonder if she actually even reflected on the goodness of God, how God protected her when she was in Pharaoh's. He closed her room, protected her while she was in Pharaoh's house. Right, What she thought was a deny was actually her protection or how he changed her name after she messed up. I wonder if she was reflecting on the goodness of God and she was able to laugh in a different way. You know, with my firstborn, I had this beautiful birth plan, right? I was gonna do it natural and it ended up in an emergency C-section. And I was devastated <laughs> in the moment. And can I tell you, the recovery was awful. Um, I, have, I experienced the most pain I have physically ever felt. I remember thinking, will I ever run again? Right? I'll never complain about running again in my life. God, I love. You know, I will, I will move my legs. <laughs> Just let me move them. Right? And at that same time, and even in the privacy of the situation and the circumstance, only my parents and, and my husband saw the pain of even standing up for weeks that in this, I could also, even though there was sorrow, right? Things didn't go as planned, but there was also a pure joy that only came through the process of sorrow, 
And that joy came as I held Hannah, a perfectly beautiful, healthy baby girl. And I understood at that moment that you can have both sorrow and joy at the same time. And honestly, without the road of sorrow, I don't know that we would ever experience the pure joy of God. You know, Tim Keller, former senior pastor of Redeemer Church in New York City, actually says it like this, we are not to expect that God will exempt Christians from suffering and inner darkness, nor that he will simply lift us out of darkness as soon as we pray, rather than expecting God to remove the sorrow and replace it with happiness, we should look for glory, a taste and conviction, an increasing sense of God's presence that helps us rise above the darkness. So how do we find joy in the midst of sorrow? When culture conditions us to find joy in our accolades, in what we accomplish in this life, our titles, our positions, our homes, all the accumulations, right? That's, that's the lie that we believe that, and there's nothing wrong with those things until they become the Isaac, right? They become the thing in which can become idols in our life. And it's actually through the process of all of being stripped away of these things down the road of sorrow that we actually taste true joy, true joy, which is knowing him. It's walking in relationship. It's hearing God's voice and hearing him say, well done. It's hearing God's voice for your own life every day. He is the prize. He is the promise. And he gives us a joy that, that only comes through the process. You know, this is the mark of maturity, church. This is what he's calling us up into. He's calling us into the way through suffering, right? Not to avoid it, not a way around of it. But as we walk through it, we are going to experience the joy of the Lord. Before we all enter this new normal church, I want to encourage us to make three exchanges that are available to us. Complaining for Thanksgiving. Put the key in. You have it. Put the key in and begin to thank God instead of complaining. Control for trust. When you feel that need to control things, release even greater. Release your hands. When you want to grip, open your hands. And thirdly, take that sorrow and exchange it for true joy. Doesn't mean we, it doesn't mean sorrow doesn't exist, but it means that the road through suffering actually brings joy, true joy. I opened today's message talking about Pentecost Sunday and the power of the Holy Spirit and how much we need Him. Church, we need the power of the Holy Spirit in order to make these exchanges. These exchanges don't, didn't, won't happen. They are, they're not even possible without Jesus. And so for some of you listening today, that first step, this next step for you is actually inviting Him into your life to be Lord of your life so that these grand exchanges can be possible to living the life that God's called you to. We wanna pray with both groups today. The first group being those that wanna make that decision, that invitation to allow Jesus to come in, to make God Lord of your life. And that second group, I wanna pray with you because you're tired and you are weary today. And I want to encourage you that God has the gift of the Holy Spirit. He wants to infill, He wants to breathe on you again because you have much life on the other side of this new normal to live for His glory. And He wants to breathe a fresh fire in your soul this morning. And I wanna pray with you. I'm gonna pray with that second group first and then Jeremy's gonna lead those that wanna make that decision in just a moment. So Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for your gift of the Holy Spirit this morning. I thank you that you, like you met the disciples in the upper room, that you would meet everyone listening under the sound of my voice in their living rooms, that they would sense your presence in a way that they have never sensed it before. Would you fill us up to overflowing, empower us to live the life that you have called us to live. Father, to make these, in the courage to make these exchanges in the name of Jesus, amen. We love you church and we'll see you next weekend.